beyond saving. But I have to try. The sprawling city of Gotham, riddled with a stench of corruption that not even the relentless rainfall can wash away. Its pockets of gothic architecture are relics of a time gone by, with intricate stone mouldings resembling flourishing plant life. Step inside a gothic cathedral and you'll notice this. It is as if the whole structure is sprouting up out of the ground because these buildings were constructed to proclaim a greater story, a story of growth and harmony. And the scenes that take place in and around these buildings are among the few moments in the film when the rain stops and the sun breaks through the clouds, tantalising glimpses of what was or what should be. The gothic imagery continues because this city is protected by a living gargoyle, a terrifying ever-watching presence perched on the precipice from the skyscraper to the city hall, a creature of the night who fights back against the corruption. They call him the Batman. We first encounter him on Thursday, October the 31st, Halloween night. This is a time in which the city is especially handed over to chaos. On this night, everyone wears a mask, and the anonymized criminals fit right in. It's easier to be a wolf when you're surrounded by sheep dressed like wolves. But the wolves aren't immune to fear. Remember that origin story for Batman that was first revealed in Detective Comics number 33? Came out in 1939, written by Bill Finger. And we read this on one of the panels. Criminals are a superstitious, cowardly lot. So my disguise must be able to strike terror into their hearts. I must be a creature of the night. Black, terrible, a... Uh, a bat. Batman's symbol is burned into the sky as a warning, and the criminals would be wise to heed it. The camera settles on a particular gang down in the deepest depths of the city, the Metro. One of their boys is about to go through something of an initiation. He is to do his worst to an unfortunate victim selected from the train. He catches a glimpse of Batman's warning projected up into the heavens and he hesitates. Notice how his mask covers just half of his face. This is a youngster who's on the cusp of committing to his criminality. He doesn't have to go ahead with this. And part of him doesn't want to. Hidden in the chaos is the element, waiting to strike like snakes. The snake is the ancient symbol for evil, spreading corruption by tempting people through lies. And this is what the Batman identifies, lurking within the murky depths of Gotham. Will this youngster look up and heed Batman's warning, or will he look down and continue to form an alliance with the snake? Well, it is at this moment that Batman himself shows up. The youngster recognises him straight away, but his fellow gang members scoff. It is Halloween after all, everyone's in costume, surely this isn't the actual Batman. Oh, but it is. And this is how he introduces himself. I'm vengeance. Batman doesn't just enact vengeance, he sees himself as the personification of vengeance. To encounter him is to encounter vengeance, judgement. This is a horror movie. <laughs> And what's surprising about Batman is that this dark, masked figure of the night is actually the good guy. Batman's arrival is so terrifying that even the victim he's here to save is afraid of him. Please don't hurt me. And the youngster with the half mask is rooted to the spot. We see the fear in his eyes, and with that fear the possibility of transformation. Perhaps he won't go the way of his fellow gang members. We'll now be entering spoiler territory. This film is a meditation on judgement. Who can enact judgement and how is it to be enacted? There is an intense focus on the human eye, the organ of judgement. Batman uses advanced contact lenses to record each day and document his observations. That's what's important to him, what he sees. Later on, he uses these contact lenses to see the world from Selina's perspective. It is Batman's watchful eye, his judgement, that is his greatest weapon. And he is framed as a righteous judge, or at least he's trying to be. But at the very beginning of the film, we see the world through the eyes, literally through the eyes, point of view of a different character, Edward Nashton, the Riddler. And as the story develops, he pronounces his own cataclysmic judgement on the city of Gotham. You've seen Gotham's true face now. Together, we've unmasked it. It's corruption, it's perversion, masquerading under the guise of renewal. 
but unmasking is not enough. The day of judgment is finally upon us. You see, up to this point, the Riddler had been laying a breadcrumb trail. A sequence of riddles for Batman to follow, exposing the extent of Gotham's corruption. And now, as the new mayor-elect, Bella Real, rises to the challenge of serving the city, the Riddler is too cynical to give her a chance. He wants to tear the entire system down. With a judgement reminiscent of the biblical flood, a breaching of the seawall plunging the city into the primordial waters of chaos, in his twisted way he sees himself as a Noah figure, or perhaps even as God himself, he is pronouncing the judgement himself. He's the one on the right side in his eyes, up above the waters of chaos, and he wants Batman to join him aboard the Ark, or should I say Arkham State Hospital. We were gonna be safe here! We could watch the whole thing together! A safe vantage point, protected from the waters of the Flood. The Riddler admires Batman, he thinks they share the same goal. And the superficial similarities between them are striking. Both characters are orphans, both are determined to bring down the corruption of Gotham, both wear black masks to instill fear, both keep extensive journals of everything they see, and one of the Riddler's recruits even says this. Who the hell are you? I'm vengeance. Echoing Batman's own words. I'm vengeance. But Batman is repulsed by the idea of being likened to the Riddler. You showed me what was possible. You showed me all it takes is fear and a little focused violence. You inspired me. This is all in your head. You're sick. Twisted. How can you say that? And this is the crucial question. What makes these two characters different? What makes Batman the hero and the Riddler the villain? Well, keep watching because we'll get stuck into that question. But first, it's interesting to consider the influence of the Riddler. He has a small but not insignificant online fan base, which he mobilises to do his bidding. For the most part, his videos are recorded in portrait. He's used to working with smartphones, the modern device. And this means that when his videos are broadcast on the Gotham City One TV channel, there's a mismatch in aspect ratio. In order to fit the image on a landscape screen, it has to be pillar boxed, i.e. black bars either side. It's a subtle detail, but it reflects the disconnect between mainstream media and the new media. You see, the Riddler has built his following in the dark recesses of the internet. Hey guys. Thanks for all the comments, and uh, a special thanks to everyone for the tips on detonators. Detonators? What this community has meant to me these weeks, these months, let's just say none of us is alone anymore. And now he has been thrust into the public conversation. We're watching an internet phenomenon get captured by broadcast television. He is clearly expressing something that lots of people are feeling a total lack of confidence in Gotham's institutions. The Riddler's anthem is the song Ave Maria, a musical realisation of the Roman Catholic Hail Mary prayer. And it's worth pressing into the significance of this. When Adam and Eve formed a corrupt alliance with the serpent in the Garden of Eden, God made a promise. A promise that one day the miraculous offspring of the woman, her seed, would come to crush the serpent. He, the seed, will crush your head, and you, the serpent, will strike his heel. Of course, in the Bible this promise is fulfilled in Jesus, born of the Virgin Mary. He came to deal the lethal blow to the serpent, but it was costly for him. And it is that deliverance which is spoken of in the song Ave Maria. It carries a personal weight for the Riddler. This song was sung by the choir boys when Thomas Wayne announced his mayoral candidacy. And that's why I'm here today, to announce not only my candidacy for mayor, but also the creation of the Gotham Renewal Fund. And the Riddler was in that choir. You know, I was there that day. The day the great Thomas Wayne announced he was running for mayor made all those promises. Oh, we 
later he was dead and everybody just forgot about us. Throughout the film, the song plays with a sad sense of irony. The Riddler no longer believes in renewal or salvation. All he can see now are the snakes. And he wants to tear down the entire city. So why is the Batman different to the Riddler? Well, the answer emerges on the far side of the Flood. Batman ventures back into the chaos to fight the Riddler's forces. And as a dangling, snake-like power cable threatens to electrocute his people, he severs it, plunging himself down into the waters, an extraordinary act of self-sacrifice. And this is what sets him apart from the Riddler. He is willing to die for the people of Gotham, and not just some personal recruits at the fringes of society, regular civilians who might themselves be corrupt. He cares about them. He cares about the city. And even as he considers whether it might be beyond saving, he doesn't give up. And after his act of self-sacrifice, it's not over. Batman rises up out of the waters, a baptism of sorts. He's alive, and like Moses, he leads his people through the waters and up onto dry ground, accompanied by a pillar of fire. I'm starting to see now. I have had an effect here. But not the one I intended. Vengeance won't change the past mine or anyone else's. I have to become more. People need hope. And that's the key. The Riddler stopped at vengeance. The Batman is a saviour figure. And whilst his symbol serves as a warning to those who choose to perpetuate the corruption of Gotham, it becomes a beacon of hope to those who are longing for peace and justice. Some have said that the Riddler represents the Old Testament God of the Bible, and the Batman represents the New Testament God. But I don't think that's right. They are the same God. And yes, there is a development that happens from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Sometimes in the Old Testament, God chooses to enact his judgment through human beings. But under the New Covenant, we are told that those who live by the sword die by the sword. Vengeance is the Lord's, not ours. But the entire sweep of scripture, Old and New Testaments, testify to this. It all testifies to the promised serpent crusher who laid down his life. The sins of the entire world were visited upon him, the eternal son of God. So the way I see it, the Riddler doesn't even understand the Old Testament. He isolates the judgment of God and appropriates it for himself. What about Selina? Well, she's fascinating because like the Riddler, she believes that Gotham is beyond saving. Its corruption claimed the life of her friend Annika. She doesn't go as far as tearing the city down, but she comes close to killing the architects of her pain, in particular her father, Falcone. But Batman persuades her otherwise. Come on, Vengeance. Let's go kill that son of a bitch. This creep too, let's finish this. No! no. We'll get him. But not that way. There is no other way. He owns the city. Cross that line. You'll become just like him. Listen to me. Don't throw your life away. There it is, that point of no return that Batman so fears. For Batman, it's vital. If the good guys become killers seeking revenge, there's no hope for the city. Selina is persuaded by this, but ultimately she decides to abandon ship. You know this place is never going to change. With Carmine gone, it's only going to get worse for you. There's going to be a power grab. It'll be bloody. I know. But the city can't change. It won't. I have to try. It's going to kill you eventually, you know that. And she has a point. Batman has not brought about an ultimate deliverance. He's an imperfect judge. But it seems that Gotham is better with him than without him. And where he falls short, he leaves us with a longing for someone even greater. If you enjoyed this video and would like to go even deeper, why not check out our brand new online community? Joining is quick and easy and free. The link is in the description below. I'd also love to recommend a sensational podcast called Popcorn Theology. They have a great episode on the Batman. I'll put a link in the description. Thanks so much for watching. Do subscribe if you'd like to stay in the loop and I will see you soon.